On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayburg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. Story, presented by Austin Film Festival, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers and directors. The premise for Groundhog Day came from an original script by a writer named Danny Rubin, who had this wonderful conception. I read his original script. Despite its flaws, I ended up crying at the end, and I had this feeling like this is kind of a, it's a wonderful life for our time, and I'm a sucker for that Frank Capra stuff. In this week's On Story, Groundhog Day screenwriter Danny Rubin discusses his collaboration with Harold Ramis on the celebrated film. I hope you enjoy the festivities. There's talk of a blizzard. Do you ever have deja vu, Mrs. Lancaster? I don't think so, but I could check with the kitchen. No, that's okay. Thank you. Will you be checking out today, Mr. Connors? I'd say the chance of departure is 80%. My brother was moderating a, an animation panel with um, John Lester and Brad Bird, and they were talking uh, afterwards. And uh, Brad asked my brother, uh, oh, are you in the business? He goes, well, not really, but my brother's a screenwriter. And Brad does what you do, what you'll see all of us doing this whole conference, going, hmm, that's nice. Uh, uh, has he made anything? And this is where my relatives get to sit back and wait and savor the moment. And he goes, oh, yeah, my brother, he wrote Groundhog Day. And Brad Bird stops. And his eyes open and his jaw drops and he goes, your brother is Harold Ramis? <laughs> it wasn't perfect by any means because Harold and I were coming at the project from very different places. But I think in retrospect, it really was ideal because look at the product. You cannot argue with that at all. And of course, the process for me was just as you would imagine, exciting and grueling and uh, heartbreaking and, and uh, um, also exhilarating. One of the things that, uh, that Harold had told me was that we're not going to change the beginning. I love that it begins in the middle. And um, cut to <laughs> uh, a few months into development and one of his uh, associates, Whitney White, says, you know, we miss kind of going through the process with Phil and having him discover the day and discover the repetition. I think that would be fun. Let's try that. And so then we started backing it up a little bit at a time. At first, cautiously, it just the night before when they're pulling into Punxsutawney. And then we say, oh, let's give it a little bit more. And it started with him driving to Pittsburgh, getting in the van. And that's the way the, the film started at shooting. And they had to go back and shoot a new beginning because they decided to push it all the way back to the TV station. Fun in Puxatani, Phil. For your information, Hairdo, there is a major network interested in me. Yeah, that would be the home shopping network. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Go wait in the van, will you? That was nice, Phil. <laughs> Big trees. <laughs> Stop, Kenny. Look, can you handle the ten or not? Yeah, okay. yeah. L listen, if for any reason you don't want to rush back, I, I can do the five tomorrow. Oh, come on. I want to stay an extra second in Punxsutawney, please. The movie that I wrote was not really a studio Hollywood movie. It did not conform to romantic comedy um, conventions. It wasn't designed to be a formula movie. It was designed to be something else. And I thought it was very successful. Basically, when I... Um, sent it around uh, to get it produced or looked at or whatever, everybody called me in for a meeting and nobody wanted to produce it. 
Jones. In fact, what they said to me was, I loved Groundhog Day. Of course we can't make it. Harold was turning it from whatever it was that I had into a romantic comedy. And if you have a romantic comedy, there's a couple things you have to do. One, there's, it's a two-hander, so you have to show the woman's character a little bit more profoundly. And you didn't have to do much, and obviously the um, Rita character is not that well-developed. It's very simple. Um, but one thing that he did by putting the weather station scene at the beginning, it wasn't just to introduce Phil and the kind of person he was, but it showed us Rita and what she was like. And it kind of created that imagery of us, uh, of her in our mind, you know, this floaty, dreamy um, character. <laughs> you guys are gonna have fun. Mm -hmm. She's fun. That was part of it. And the other thing had to do with the pickup scene. Harold said, you know, when you've got a really great idea for a scene, you've got to give it to your major characters. You can't throw it away on a minor character. So that was a big lesson. It makes a lot of sense. Can I buy you a drink? Okay. Jim Beam, ice, water. For you, miss? Sweet vermouth and the rocks with the twist, please. What are the chances of getting out of town today? The van still won't start. Larry's working on it. Oh, wouldn't you know it. Can I buy you a drink? Okay. Uh, sweet vermouth, rocks with a twist, please. For you, miss? The same. That's my favorite drink. Mine, too. When I wrote this originally, it was just like that, but the, it was between Phil and just some other woman who lived in town. He'd already been through Nancy and did the pickup with her, and now he's doing this pickup stuff with this other person. And the way his relationship develops with, with Rita is a little bit more organic. He just sees her around, and it becomes very casual, and then he starts realizing that he's in love with her. And... They have a wonderful day together, but at the end of it, she says, see you tomorrow. And then he's like heartbroken because he realizes he will never, ever, ever have a long-term relationship with anybody. And he will always be frustrated in this, this uh, feeling he has for Rita. Rocky Road. Oh, I love Rocky Road. Yeah, I thought so. You have to stay. Oh, no, really, Phil, I'm tired. We can see each other tomorrow. No, tonight. Oh. It's gotta be tonight. I had a, a section in the script um, originally where I thought Phil would seek out expert advice. And um, I went through a bunch of different things. And among them was psychiatric advice to find out if he was crazy. I, in my imagination, he's lying there talking to the psychiatrist and, it, and having this personal session and then slowly we pull back and realize we're in the lobby of the hotel. And this guy is a guest getting ready to leave. There is no psychiatrist in this small town, but this was a guy who just came in for the festival and was a, a tourist, just like everybody else, and sort of caught him. And so it's like, fine. And so the whole thing was taking place in the lobby. To me, that was funny and uh, the way I pictured it. From the very first, Harold, I think, pictured this scene. He said, what if it was uh, a local guy, but um, he fancies himself maybe a psychologist, but at best he's just sort of like a, a lay church, uh, you know, gives advice to people. Most of my work is with couples, families. I have an alcoholic now. Well, you went to college, right? I mean, it wasn't veterinary psychology, was it? D didn't you take some kind of course that covered this stuff? Yeah. Sort of, I guess. Uh, abnormal psychology. So, what do I do? I think we should meet again. How's tomorrow for you? Is that not good? I wrote it a bunch of different ways in the lobby, and every single time, Harold was just like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then he'd come back with another draft that had something like this, and I'd change it back, and he'd change it back. The thing is, it is totally unimportant. It didn't matter. But when you're real close to these things, you can't really tell what's going to be important and what isn't, what's going to lead to things and what isn't. Phil? Phil Connors? Phil Connors, I thought that was you. Hi, how you doing? Thanks for watching. Hey, hey. Now, don't you tell me you don't remember me, because I sure as heck fire remember you. Not a chance. <laughs> Ned! 
Ryerson. Needle nose, Ned, Ned the head. Come on, buddy. Case Western High. Ned Ryerson, I did the whistling belly button trick at the high school talent show. Bing! Ned Ryerson got the shingles real bad senior year, almost didn't graduate. Bing! Again! Ned Ryerson, I dated your sister Mary Pat a couple times till you told me not to anymore. Well? Ned Ryerson? Bing! Bing! This is one of the things I love about theater, uh, whether it's movies or theater, uh, live stage stuff, is that is pretty much exactly how I wrote it, but I did not imagine Stephen Tobolowsky. I didn't imagine him totally, totally going for it like that, totally over the top. And um, I, I just love how uh, a good actor and good direction, all that makes, makes whatever we do that much better. When it's done right, it's, it's a total multiplier. And I love laughing at my own stuff as if I'm discovering it for the first time because it's through somebody else's interpretation. So that was great. But as I was saying, that's the way I wrote it, but that didn't happen until the very end of the script. The way I had set it up, he just keeps punching this guy, he just keeps punching him. Phil? Phil? Hey, Phil Connors! Ned? No matter what else happens, it's become a habit. Even after he's a god and everything else, he still punches the guy. And then at some point, he stops and goes, wait a second, who is this guy? It's like a war that somebody had fought years ago that they, uh, they still held the grudge, but they couldn't even remember what the original feud was about. So that's when he decided to stop and just, just talk to him and figure out who he is. And then he finds out, oh, right, the insurance agent. And after that, he goes back to hitting him again. So <laughs> uh, kind of my point of view about Ned and Phil was that even though Phil is really, really very developed and enlightened and self-actualized by the end of the story, he's still human. And he's still a person, and he still just wants to punch that guy. I kind of thought that was a humanizing element. Harold was very good about keeping things very consistent and clean and clear and unambiguous. And he followed the progression much more naturally. And like he, he wanted to have that kind of uh, homosexual panic with Phil being able to get rid of Ned without having to punch him, but finding a different way by hugging him a little bit too close. <laughs> I have missed you so much. I don't know where you're headed, but can you call in sick? Uh, <laughs> I gotta get going. Uh, <laughs> it's good to see you, Phil. <laughs> and then at the end, by actually buying insurance from him and like they're best friends. Phil? Oh. Phil Connors, I thought that was you. <laughs> Rita, this is Ned Ryerson. He's my new insurance agent. I'll say. <laughs> I have not seen this guy for 20 years. He comes up to me and then he buys whole life term, Uniflex, fire, theft, auto, dental, health, with the optional death and dismemberment plan, water damage. Phil, this is the best day of my life. Mine too. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> I thought that was a bit of a, a dishonest cheat, but it sure is satisfying, isn't it? That was part of the, the sort of personality conflict that, that went into the development of this piece. Is this what you do with eternity? Now you know. <laughs> That's not the worst part. What's the worst part? The worst part is that tomorrow you will have forgotten all about this and you'll treat me like a jerk again. No. It's all right, I am a jerk. No, you're not. It doesn't make any difference. I've killed myself so many times, I don't even exist anymore. Well, sometimes I wish I had a thousand lifetimes. I don't know, Phil. Maybe it's not a curse. It just depends on how you look at it. That was the scene where it is coming from Rita that kind of turns the corner for Phil. It is something that Rita says that it sort of inspires him to wake up the next day with more energy and renewed vigor and all that. And it was quite explicit. Well, gee, Phil, if, if I, I wish I had a thousand days to live over, whatever. Um, um, Harold and I both wrote that scene back and forth. There's, I can think of little lines that were said that I knew that I wrote and ones that I knew that I didn't write. I don't remember exactly how it came about. But the thing was, 
when I first designed the original screenplay, it was almost like an experiment. My background was in the sciences, and so I kind of think that way. And it, I wanted to plunk somebody down, this character, in this situation, and kind of watch it play out and see how it developed. And what I thought was interesting was just the process of repetition caused him to go through these big changes in the way he looked at his life. And that included his coming around to um, losing his ego and starting to notice other people and trying to join civilization instead of um, prove himself to it or something like that. And so th there's a little dishonesty involved. It was really a, kind of a major change in the underpinnings of the script to change it from the experiment, the repetition changing Phil, to having Rita change Phil. But it is a romantic comedy, and we're trying to cement those two characters. I don't deserve someone like you. But if I ever could, I swear I would love you for the rest of my life. That final piece was pretty much Bill's improvisation. He told me it was a, a moment that he'd actually experienced in his own life, and, and I guess he had felt it was very romantic and it was appropriate to the piece. He wanted to do it here, and so he made up the lines as he went along. But um, that impulse to have the moment with him talking to her while she's asleep was Bill. And he actually wrote a lot of the little, you know, funny clip, quippy lines in there. You can just hear Bill all over it. So, you know, when he says hairdo or, or something like that, or uh, I think even the whistling belly button trick. I mean, these things sort of feel Bill-ish. And uh, he, he claims to write a lot of the dialogue that he uses in all of his movies and never asks for credit or thinks he deserves it. He's, that's how you divide the, the parts. He does the acting, I do the writing, Harold does the directing, whatever. But that's the way he looked at it. Rita really was... She was a character, but she was really a signal that things had changed for Phil by the fact that she was able to fall in love with him, showed that he was lovable, and which he wasn't before. And um, that's it was a signal to us, but it wasn't designed to have the same kind of ending. I mean, Harold had a, a, he wanted to have a version where um, Phil runs downstairs and plays the piano real quick and realizes it wasn't a dream. He really can play the piano. To him, that was definitive, but then chose something simpler, which was just looking out the window and seeing that it's different. Um, um, in, when I wrote the original, I just needed to come up with an ending that was funny and that was um, on the same level as the sort of the, un, uh, the surprising nature of the whole movie. So what happened is he wakes up and he can't, he's so excited, it's, it's finally February 3rd, and Reed is not all that into it. And as she leaves, we realize that she's been repeating February 3rd over and over again. And it always starts with her waking up with Phil, and now she takes... I'm sorry, what was that again? I'm a god. You're a god. I'm a god, I'm not the god. I don't think. Because you survived a car wreck? You folks ready to order? I didn't just survive a wreck. I wasn't just blown up yesterday. I have been stabbed, shot, poisoned, frozen, hung, electrocuted, and burned. Oh, really? And every morning I wake up without a scratch on me, not a dent in the fender, I am an immortal. So that was also pretty much from the original script. One, one difference is when he says, I'm a god, that's how he comes into it. He's, he's just, I don't know if you remember the sequence, but this is after he survived all of the suicide attempts, and then he decides he must be immortal, and here he is announcing it. Um, so he's a god for about five seconds. He comes out, I'm a god. She goes, hey, no, you're not. And he goes, oh, okay. In, in uh, the original, I played it out for a little bit longer, and he went on and said, I... Uh, okay, if I'm God, what kind of a God am I going to be? And that starts to open up his heart a little bit. He tries to, to do some role playing. Um, 
and in the end concludes, I don't know if I'm a god or I'm not a god. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. The fact is I'm still stuck here and I still have to deal with every day. There are two scenes I'd like to queue up except they don't exist. Uh, one of them is the, the library scene. Um, not, uh, it was actually at the bed and breakfast. Um, the question might be, how long was Phil in the time loop? How long did he keep repeating it? I kind of had always had in my mind that the whole point of the experiment was that Phil lives longer than a single lifetime. It was a way, by having this repetitive day, was a way of getting at eternity and, and eternal life. He lives a very, very, very long time. Um, and in order to show that, I had him figure out how to mark his time in a way that he could remember. It's hard because you can't write anything down. You can't mark a calendar. But I decided that if he read a page of a book every day, he could remember where he was. So there's this big bookcase in the bed and breakfast. And every morning he goes down and he reads one page of one book. So you know that by the time he's gotten to the last page of the first book, he's, it's probably been about a year. And then he gets to the end of the row. And then he gets to the bottom of the shelf. And then there is a very momentous day where he reads the last page of the last book of the last shelf. And you see him put it down and then, in a very depressed way, walk all the way back down to the beginning to start over again. <laughs> now, I thought this was visceral. And I really wanted that weight of time to, to, to come across the screen. Um, Harold was talking with the studio, and they said, that's way too long. People's heads will explode. It can't last that long. So how long did it last? The studio said, two weeks. <laughs> and they were kind of adamant. And this is where Harold was quite ingenious. He's, he's, he's not only a good, you know, he was a, he's a good guy, and he's a, 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 you know, creatively, you've seen his work, um, um, real funny stuff and innovative stuff. Um, but he was a smart politician. He knew how to succeed in the studio system. Um, and they gave him a hard time, too, in a lot of other projects I, I know about. But uh, in this case, he took out the bookcase and took out any references to how long Phil had been there. And then people could just use their imaginations. And then there was no reason to have any big fight over it. I think he thought that a lifetime was too long anyway. And his sensibility was that maybe he was there about 10 years. And I think the film kind of feels like that. Um, uh, it's rumored uh, that I had 10,000 years of repetition because that has Buddhist overtones. And this delights me to no end. Uh, but that wasn't true. That wasn't my intention. Harold shielded me from a lot of the studio politics. And at the same time, his sensibilities were always very consistent with the way studios made, made comedy movies. So it wasn't a big fight for him, except for me. Just because there are, there are only a handful of classic stories that deal with this kind of magical um, time shift kind of thing. Um, the one that did become kind of topical was It's a Wonderful Life. On the movie marquee in my original script, that's what was playing. And the reason was because when I was a kid, every time you turn on the television, that's what was on. <laughs> every single time. <laughs> and around Christmas time, even more so. Um, and I thought that was funny, that it would be something that, of all the movies, it's one that you've seen a million times, and there it is again. I'm just giving you a flavor for, for what it was adapted from in order to come up with something that really captured the essence of the original, didn't really change it that much, and yet completely transformed it by making it, I think, a lot more, uh, the edges more sharper and clear, and the whole thing came off as, as more powerful, I think. I, I didn't know for sure that it would ever have any longevity, which it apparently has, which is great. That's, that's winning the lottery. You can't predict those things. He managed to, to make it the way he wanted, um, to all of our delights. You've been watching A Conversation with Danny Rubin on On Story. For more On Story, check out our free podcast at onstory.tv or search the iTunes store. And get the book today, On Story, Screenwriters and Their Craft, on Amazon. Thank you.